Hello. How's it going? Okay, now they have your headphones on. Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Good morning, Jason. Dan, can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. How's it going? Good. 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 All right. So as folks are coming in, uh, go ahead and add yourself to today's minutes. I'll drop the link in. The uh, document is also in the calendar invite. Jason, since I see you're driving, I can uh, take care of that one for you. That would be great. Thanks, Dan. You bet. And of course, I will be looking for two scribes. Raise your hand. Everyone jump on. Taking notes. Thank you, sir. Do we have Mark yet? Mark, Mark, Mark. We have another volunteer scribe, Christian, Jason, Ray. Jason's driving, so don't don't take notes, Jason. Uh, <laughs> hi, Jason. Right. Ray, will you take notes? I, I think I'm supposed to talk this meeting, so, oh. so I'm a good one to take notes. Christian? I could, but I cannot figure out how I can see and scribe at the same time. I can either see one or the other window. Oh, you can make it not full screen. So I usually right. like make it a little yeah, smaller. I do too. All right, I, I, I ascribe. Great, so we'll both Thank chime you. in and then if yeah. I miss something, you'll catch it. Thank you, Christian. All right, so. Mark Underwood from NIST is our presenter today, so we definitely want to wait for, for that. Um, excuse the delay. So while we're waiting uh, and uh, everyone's sort of logging in and uh, getting set up, um, we've, we've grown so much and we're, you know, um, Heading towards uh, the TOC in April, so um, you know why, why don't I go around the you know the, the virtual room and uh, um, you know just just to have everyone introduce themselves, uh, so uh, you know the, the new folks know who's here and um, the new folks get uh, introductions. So I'll I'll start off. Um, I'm Dan Shaw. Uh, Better known as D Shaw, uh, I come from uh, Node.js community uh, and 
um, you know, was looking for a, a place inside the cloud native ecosystem to, to plug in, uh, and you know, leaning on my uh, background in, in uh, security from uh, uh, my days uh, working uh, for the Department of Defense, plugged into um, security policy uh, with uh, JJ and Sarah. Uh, so very happy to be here and uh, facilitating this. Um, so I'm going to go around my screen uh, and try not to uh, be too confusing. So Ray, you're you're uh, the immediate next person on my screen. So can you go next? Sure. Um, I'm Ray Colleen, and uh, I've been at Google for about 14 years, and I've done various bits of enterprise pieces throughout my career here. And lately, uh, for the last four years, I'm working on GCP Cloud, um, trying to make it more accessible and easier to do policy management for large organizations. And uh, recently turned my attention towards Kubernetes and trying to do the same thing there. So i um, generally concerned about administrators and I have a place in my heart for them and want to make sure that, that uh, we're doing things right by them. So. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. JJ? Yeah. Uh, can you can hear you me? Say me? Yep. Uh, I said JJ. Oh, this is uh, JJ. Um, I worked in enterprise. I started off my career in enterprise and then uh, worked on infrastructure since 2007-ish uh, with Motorola. Then when Motorola was part of Google, then uh, built greater cloud infrastructure. And then uh, since August, I've been passionately involved with uh, uh, security as a uh, primary thing and uh, authorization specifically and then created a few effort a uh, few initiatives and efforts around it and uh, happy to help out in any way thanks excellent Christian I'm mute. Um, hi I'm Christian I work in Google's cloud security team I've been working on the IAM team for the last two three years I think um, and I'm now looking at uh, uh, Kubernetes and Istio for in, in particular around authorization policy but also talk a lot with Ray about policy in general. Good on. Sarah? I had to unmute. Um, I am uh, part of uh, Google prior Firebase, um, recently moved to GCP and am working on infrastructure that supports both Firebase rules, which is authorization policy, and Google Cloud Functions, which has its own needs in terms of serverless and um, the events that trigger functions. Awesome. Jason? Hi, uh, Jason Mello uh, with uh, Nearform. Uh, previously spent the last four or five years or so over at ADP, working on a lot of uh, public cloud, cloud native initiatives over there, uh, early with Docker, Kubernetes, uh, more recently, uh, as well as some uh, involvement on the uh, open tracing side uh, of things. Great. Welcome, Jason. Good, good to have you on board. Prabhat? Uh, I'm Prabhat uh, from WSO2. And uh, so my focus is mostly identity and access management. And I've been with WSO2 for more than 10 years now. Well done. Shri? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I'm Shri Tomiri, and uh, I'm the product lead for identity and access management for uh, Pivotal proprietary products and uh, open source as well. Uh, I've been lately uh, looking into Kubernetes, IAM, as well as uh, Istio and how we can leverage uh, those models uh, for uh, pivotal products. Great, thank you. Doug? Yeah, uh, Doug Davis from IBM. Uh, heading up the team in charge of working on all things cloud native in the open source community with uh, obviously a main focus these days on things like Kubernetes and Istio and that kind of stuff. Great. Um, uh, I'm gonna butcher this uh, issue. Uh, yes, I. My name is Yisui. Um, I Yisui, work for you. Google um, in uh, the Kubernetes GKE teams. Um, I'm looking to uh, uh, security enforcement in general on a Kubernetes cluster. Excellent. Fantastic. Well, did I miss anybody? That, uh, maybe it. 
So, um, the glaring uh, person that I'm missing is uh, uh, Mark, uh, who is our presenter today. Uh, so I might need to uh, um, pivot from that. Um, Ray and Shree, uh, I know you're, uh, you've been uh, beginning to work on the, the, the white paper. Maybe uh, we could pivot to you know, sort of introducing everybody to, to that uh, and uh, check in, see how that's going. Um, I think Ray has done actually. Ray. Ray, do you want to, are, are you uh, yeah. uh, able to share some, some of that for, for us as we wait for work? Uh, sure, I can uh, talk about it. I think JJ and Shri are, are being very uh, <laughs> helpful in the amount of effort that they put into this. They've done quite a lot of, of work, and um, I don't know why they keep nominating me. So I, I, I think it's uh, the cop potato or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's it's a it's a it's a group effort. Uh, yeah. but I think Okay, I can. Uh, I, I got to figure out how to present here. I have a, a let me get out a full screen here and present a window. Um, and I missed the meeting, so maybe Dan, while Ray's getting set up, you can just like give an overview of what, what's the context for the white paper. Sorry, I was out of town. Okay, uh, so um, the yeah, the white paper uh, you know begins to go in building on the the use cases that we've uh, been hearing uh, and you know taking comes distilling down. Uh, you know, all of, yes, Sri, are, are we recording? We are. So this is uh, um, yep. recorded for posterity, and uh, I will post that to the, the meeting doc that we all signed in on um, when we're done. Thank you. Yeah. You bet. And uh, you know, now I've got all the, the issues worked out with uh, getting, getting uh, Zoom set up. Cool. So, um, yes. Go ahead, Red. So yeah, Sarah, what we, what we did is when we talked about kind of where to start with this, we, we wanted to come up with a set of personas. Um, you know, we, we, we talked about the enterprise um, or administrator's bill of rights. And, you know, it was an interesting discussion. And then various people said, okay, well, um, that's cool. Well, what are the different personas and what are their needs? So we wrote the administrator's bill of rights, obviously, from the administrator's point of view, right? And, um, but, you know, hey, there's developers and compliance folks and, a bunch of other things. So Shri and, and, and JJ and myself, like we kind of went through and threw a bunch of personas into a document um, to kind of start. And, you know, on my team currently, we, we tend to give these people names. So hopefully eventually maybe we'll name and we can start to talk to them. Like, oh, hey, Charlie, right? Our cluster admin, she does this. And Olivia, our org admin, does this. And so hopefully we'll get to know these people and, and um, feel affection for them as we go through and um, uh, you know, create our solution. We can always bring up these people and ask how they would experience a certain thing. So the goal is is to define what these people are, these personas, what they care about, right? And this really should be a group effort. So everybody here, just you know, ping me or ping JJ for common access. We'll share it out, and uh, you know, or and just start suggesting stuff and writing personas in here as you see them, and we can. Um, we can iterate over time. So this is a living document. This is definitely the first kind of go around. Um, and, um, you know, we'll see what we did. We probably missed some, so just let us know. So overall, we have created this concept of a, a developer, um, an enterprise operator, a resource captain, a network operator, an end user, which I find interesting, um, an infrastructure operator or, um, and then compliance, um, security admin, and um, you know, third-party security product system. I'm not sure what that is. I'll have to. That one's new to me. Um, so yeah. So uh, at the end of the day, I want to kind of go into each of these and, and talk about them. The other thing to consider here is is what angle are we looking at this from? So JJ and I had an interesting comment thread where we said, "Hey, as a developer, developers are, are, are both consumers of resources and they're also creating resources, right?" Mm -hmm. And so. Um, you know, coming from my background, I always think of developers as consuming, you know, resources as, you know, Google Cloud Platform or right. Amazon Web Services, like developers come in and they consume our stuff and they make new stuff, right? And so, but JJ made a very good point to say, you know, developers also create resources. 
resources, then right, they're creating new programs, they're creating new um, uh, services, those services and those resources, and they want to be able to uh, attach and, and make it take advantage of these policy systems um, you know, that exist. And I think this is where things like um, you know, what Sarah works on and being able to, to attach like you know, Firebase rules to things and, and whatnot can be really uh, interesting from an app developer point of view. So I think we need to consider those. To me, those sound like two different personas, like a developer acting in terms of consumer and a developer acting in terms of creating something. Um, both have different needs, right? Um, and so that was our, our proposal. But so I'll talk about developer as a consumer because I think it's a little bit more well defined. And in you know, in this in this case here, um, you know, a developer, we we put a few things in here, right? I, I as a developer, I need to provide logs for any changes to critical resources such as made available for auditing. So I think this is talking again. And from that, that um, producer review, I'm creating stuff, right? Um, and I think as a developer, I need to be able to tag my resources so they can be grouped by the administrator when required, right? So again, um, this is talking about from the producer point of view, right? I need to be able to add the generalized tagging infrastructure so administrators have one view of my new resources, right? And um, and la and lastly, I think as a developer, I can I can add policy checks to my resources, right? And so how do we do that and how do we make that easy? So um, thinking about developers, if I'm living in the ecosystem of the safe world, right? How do I end up integrating with that? And, and I think, you know, um, that's an interesting persona. And I haven't, we haven't written down the developer's consumer um, yet. We'll, we'll get there um, uh, soon. Okay. So enterprise operators, who are these people? Right, and and we tend to think of them on my team. We think of them as as Olivia, like they're the overall kind of like uh, IT. They're centralized teams that generally are watching over the entire universe. Right, they um, are generally trying to create a safe environment for all. They want safe by default. Is is generally where they're coming from, right? And they want to set up a set of stuff where it says, "Hey, if you just come into the system, you can do stuff. You're you're able to be productive, but you are also." not, um, but you're also, um, you know, restricted from doing things that would be dangerous to our company, dangerous to our brand, dangerous to our data, right? And so um, operators, their goal is to effectively have no people call them, right? So if they can set up some of the way, so they can basically put the exceptions in place and put everything and everybody is okay, and then they, they don't call for things that are everyday um, mundane things, then the enterprise operator is winning. Right, um, and they also need to view their system. They need to be able to troubleshoot quickly, and they need to be able to take action when when required. Um, so, you know, this is a, a key thing. So, an enterprise operator, um, you know, they need a central way to look at all their organization's resources, and so they can administer them in a single view. Implicit in that is the idea that um, there is no shadow IT. Right. So, anything that gets created must be visible. And, and, you know, people can't go over here and, and just spin up a Kubernetes cluster and administer it on their own and no one knows it exists. That's the kind of stuff that makes this an enterprise operator gives them a lot of pause, All right? Um, as an enterprise operator, I need the ability to see what has, uh, what has changed about a resource, when it changed, and who changed it, All right? So this gets into audit logging. It's about making sure that we are reporting and have easy ways to understand the state of the system and how it got there. And this is especially important during incidents, right? Uh, both outages and in security incidents. A lot of times policy changes and config changes cause outages. So knowing who and when made changes were made, you can a lot of times use those to, 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 to re recover from outages. It's also good for you know, incident response and, and certification, all right? Um, PCI in particular is very clear about needing to know uh, who has access to what, right? Um, and prove it. Um, as an enterprise operator, I need a way to delegate my policy control to lower level admins who can help me scale. Again, enterprise operators at the top level are trying to get themselves never to be called. So they want to be able to delegate stuff to lower level admins who have more knowledge about what's going on. So, you know, we talked to Costco a while back and one of the things that they were always afraid of is, look, you know, at the top level admins, when someone calls us to change a bit, we're so far removed from that bit that we have no idea what it does and it gives us a lot of anxiety. So by being able to delegate to people who actually understand what those bits do, that is a, a very important uh, feature to, to, to efficiency and to safety, all right? Um, and then as an enterprise operator, I need a, to, a way to nominate per policy type operators, both at the higher level and lower levels, 
right? So the enterprise operator is kind of the root operator. You can think of them as root in your company. They lots of times take on many hats, right? Sometimes they're the quota people, sometimes they're the access control people, sometimes they're the network admins. But in a big org, that's too much for one person to do. So they need a way to say, hey, Dan is the network operator in this company. And he has the network operator privilege at the root level. And hey, Shri is the is the quota you know resource captain, and you know she's able to determine spend and quotas for you know the company. And so it's both a horizontal scaling, but it's also a vertical scaling in terms of like okay, Dan is the you know is the network operator for the you know YouTube division, right, or something of that sort. Okay, cool. By the way, stop me anytime if any of these things are controversial. Hey, uh, Ray, uh, may I ask one question? Yeah. Um, when talking about the the operators um, in a big enterprise, uh, they are belong to the same org, but sometimes they have multiple departments. And inside one department, it's possible they will have another a small operation team uh, represent the department. Um, so, is, is there any distinguish between? Um, uh, basically, basically, I'm asking if there another division like between the operators from different departments mm -hmm. yeah, yeah that's a good question you sweet um, the, the the this particular bullet here I need a way to delegate policy control to lower level admins who help me scale so the idea here is is you'll have a departmental operator right and that operator can be given full control over their compartment right and and this is something we talked about in the administrator's Bill of Rights right the fact that like you as an as, a, as a, as an admin can compartmentalize your resources and then you and you can act autonomously right so it it, it means that, that the enterprise operator can give full rights away to you as a lower level operator and in a department and they could say you have the power to make exceptions and you have the power to be able to to do this or you don't right depending on the corporate policy does that help yeah i see thank you Okay. So, um, you know, could we express that as lower level admins, including other enterprise operators? Um, yeah, we could say including, you know, sub, sub enterprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, so you, 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 you mentioned here, um, you know, uh, shadow IT, uh, you know, is, um, is it relevant to our use cases to, um, you know, to, to have any sort of exploration of resources in or out? Um, so, you know, the assumption that there, there are no shadow resources ever is a fallacy, uh, right? You know, there's, there's probably going to be something somewhere created um, you know, by some team uh, or, you know, an acquisition where, um, you know, things are going to get uh, incorporated in. Um, is that relevant to, you know, we, we need to have uh, visibility into the resources to apply policy to it? Yeah. So, so the way I think about that is, is that um, the enterprise operator, uh, think of the root, you know, draws a rectangle and says, this is the universe, right? And mm -hmm. The universe might be a, you know, just to get down to brass tacks, a set of networks, a set of DNS uh, mm -hmm. domains, right? Um, you know, a set of, of um, you know, kind of cloud providers set up to use those networks, right, and shared out. Um, and I think within that rectangle, we do not want people to be able to create things and hide them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Now, what you described, like acquiring a company who has another whole deployment somewhere else, they're outside the rectangle, right? right? And so therefore, if they have their own DNS names, and they have their own networks and things like that, um, you know, they, you know, eventually will want to become part of the rectangle, right but um, they can be protected through the, through, you know, the, the base, the base components of security, right? Mm -hmm. Firewalls and DNS and things of those sort. Like, you know, for example, someone in shadow T can never expose something, let's say on google.com, right? right because they, just, they just can't, right? right, right. Um, and the only way to expose something on google.com is to be within the rectangle. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Those are the types of ways that I think was that help. Yep. Yep. That's yeah. clarifying. Thank you. Okay. Um, cool. Okay. So um, we can, we can move on now. I think, you know, the concept here is, is um, when we get into the enterprise operator and we started talking about like per policy type operators, right. We can start thinking of who these like per policy type operators are. And so one of them is the resource captain. Right. And, and the reason why I particularly like this one is because I think it's pretty easy in, in um, authorization to really concentrate on access control lists, right? 
and and um, and also like you know uh, filtering on labels and things like that. But another form of authorization and, and, and policy is quota policy, right? It's about are you authorized to be able to you know create another VM? Are you authorized to be able to create more users? Right? These things are controlled by uh, quota policy, right? And so a resource captain is the, is the person who is delegated to, to manage that for an organization. And similar to all of the things that an enterprise operator has, the ability to you know, see stuff and delegate and, and set policy, resource captains need the same thing for their, their purview, which is, which is quota. Um, so we can, you know, we can talk about that, but I, I think, you know, as a resource captain, I need a way to constrain how many resources a set of teams is able to use. I need to be able to delegate resource quota management to sub captains, right? Um, you know, as a, as a resource captain, I need to be alerted if, if resource quota allocation exceeds a certain amount, right? Uh, people go out of spec. And, and again, um, I think, you know, it's interesting putting these things into the equation helps us think a little bit bigger than just the, than we can get trapped in. Right? Is, there any, is there anything else besides quota that the resource captain has to worry about? Should we call him quota operator to, to stay with the, you know, nomenclature that we, you, yeah, yeah, we could, we could do that. Um, I, I didn't know I'd ask that question, right? Uh, you know, what, what, what does it mean to be a resource captain? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure any um, yeah, actually, I, I, I want to ask the same question. Actually, I'm thinking about uh, something more than the resource quota and uh, the access control. Uh, especially in Kubernetes, there's another kind of, uh, how to call it? I'd like to call it like a resource privilege. Like you can create a port with a, a certain privilege or, uh, or uh, capability. Um, some some capability or privilege will be harmful to the system, like uh, the privilege containers, that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not sure if 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 this falls into this category. Yeah. So so I don't see them as a quota operator. What 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 I just heard described there is more of like a constraint, right? So if you think about this, um, you know, this is popular on Windows, right? Like you can do um, you can say things like Windows users are not allowed to for example, change their IP, right? And it, you know, on these machines. And they're, and they're like straight policies that even though you're an administrator, the domain has prevented you through domain policy from doing certain things on your Windows machine, right? And what I, what I think you just described is the idea that a cluster admin, right, can say something like, hey, um, you know, you as a namespace pod creator, you can create pods, but these pods have to have the following characteristics. Is that true? Yeah, so actually what you are saying is this falls to a different category. Yeah, this is more of like constraint policies or, or things of that sort. I don't know what the generic category, if anyone here who has a lot of policy experience knows what those things are called, I'd love to know. Um, we call them, uh, in GCP, we call them organization policies. Um, you know, I think, uh, um, uh, you know, Windows has its own, you know, domain policies and, and things like that. So that's a very important use case, and, and it's actually one that I think, um, Firebase rules is really good at, right? Um, I see. You know, I think what they do is they look at every incoming request and they can validate the map, right, of the of the object, and then it says, "Hey, if this thing's in the this object, then kick it out," right? Um, and that's on top of authorization, like access checks. So it's like, yep, Yishui has the Yishui has the ability to to create pods, but if the pod spec doesn't look like this, we're going to kick it out, right? Sounds good. And, um, and I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, is, is that a separate policy type with a separate policy type operator, right? Or is it part of the access control system and those who create ACLs are the ones who create these types of constraints? And, and I think that that's a raging debate, right? I think in Kubernetes, that's what the admission controllers do, right? So ever, whoever sets up the admission controller would be responsible for that. Yeah. You'd have to create a custom admission controller, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but that thing could you could you could have it extend to RBAC and read RBAC policies with conditions, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know, some, something that that as we're preparing this that you know may be useful. Um, you know, I'm reticent to you know create new nomenclature, right? 
uh, what we're doing is capturing, you know, context. Um, so, uh, you know, if we have these, um, you know, implementation, um, uh, you know, separate implementation, uh, you know, in Kubernetes or whatever, uh, if we can footnote these sections with, you know, in Kubernetes, you know, this is, uh, you know, called this and, uh, you know, done how, um, then I think we'll be, you know, setting ourselves for, uh, for success as we navigate, uh, you know, the name bashing that will invariably take place. <laughs> I want to, um, I wanted to interrupt for a second. I think that's a great idea, Dan. Um, Mark Underwood is here, um, and we, we're at the half hour mark, and maybe we can switch gears and pick this up. But uh, this was a great introduction to the white paper. Just wanted to chime in with that if you want to um, go back to the originally scheduled presentation. I like that. Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, and uh, uh, Mark, uh, you know, let's let's have an open discussion around that. I know you have uh, one of your uh, peers inside of NIST that couldn't make it today, um, so you know we we could we could actually take this either way. We can you know give you the floor and uh, you know um, have the the NIST presentation now, or we can reschedule that and and continue um, you know raising the group. So, what do you think, Mark? Sorry, too many uh, conferences I've been in today, and now I'm switching platforms for the fourth time. So, <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> no, I'm, I'm ready to go with this, and I can live in this constraint time frame constraint. So, I have a deck if you want to let me share. Great. Uh, so you, you can uh, find the screen sharing. I think it's the big green thing at the, the bottom of your screen in Zoom. Uh, so let's go ahead and switch over to that. Um, why don't uh, Ray? Why don't you drop a link to um, to the use case doc into uh, into chat and into um, the minutes, and uh, we'll we'll pick that up next week and um, continue that. That's looking really good. Thank you, sir. All right, so Mark, uh, we went through um, everybody introducing themselves at the beginning of the session. Uh, before you get started into the details, uh, it'd be nice to um, you know, just, just uh, uh, introduce yourself and, and uh, share a little bit about yourself. Yeah, Thank sure. You. So I'm, uh, I'm, I work in controls and countermeasures in Synchrony. Synchrony is a uh, sort of a spinoff of GE's uh, retail finance group. Uh, it's a big company. I think we're Fortune 140 or so. Um, um, prior to that, I've been working in health informatics, and um, I'm pretty involved in the in the ontology space, uh, mostly on a volunteer basis. I co-chaired the 2015 uh, conference on ontologies for um, IoT. I have a book chapter out in on. Uh, security for IOT. So that's kind of my interest in it. Uh, this big data group that I'm going to give you the uh, an overview of today started working in 2015. I'm one of about 15 or 20. So it's really a pretty small group, not much bigger than the one that we're in now. That's been uh, working on big data and uh, basically just trying to give uh, this team some ideas of the things we worried about in that group and What's a little different from some of the other standards group, this is not a standard, it's just a special report. So it's not telling people how to do things, it's more like uh, background uh, on this. Um, oh, I forgot to mention one other thing. So I'm, I'm also pretty engaged with IEEE uh, working groups for DevOps security, that's 2675, and a suite, if you want to call them that, of the 7000 series, which is trying to deal with ethical issues. So there's some overlap with security and privacy issues and provenance for traceability of responsibility for, if you look at this um, Facebook issue that's out that people are looking at as a security issue, it really is uh, a more of a traceability and provenance and um, trust federation kind of issue, which is really, I wish people were calling it a big data problem instead of a security problem, but that's okay. You don't govern, you don't own the uh, public discourse on this. So you able to get this screen? I guess. I think I'm seeing yep. part of the screen. Is that me or everybody? 
I can make it smaller. Oh no, um, that was me. I fixed it. Okay. Looks good. All right. So the, uh, the the homepage has the URL for this work and all the documents that are uh, in draft are available directly with download. Don't have to sign in for anything. Uh, that's one thing about NIST. Uh, we're paying for that with our taxpayers, not through the uh, contributions of members like some other public working groups. So that's that's one of the advantages. So the, uh, the we're in the second draft. It's uh, a multi-volume enterprise. I forget how long it is, but it's pretty long. I'm really just talking in this uh, venue about the security and privacy work. And I'm going to give you a taste at the end of this. Let me just see where we are in time. That's after five after the hour. I'll try to stop by a quarter after and show you a few pages out of the document that I think are relevant. Sounds good. So um, this special report that's in draft has already gone through public comment. We didn't actually get a whole lot, um, which is unfortunate, but it's now going through review at, at NIST. Um, they've got some things they want us to make changes to, but I expect it'll be released for the public in early summer at the latest, if not sooner. So the strengths of, of what we've done in, in volume four anyway of this is that we've been at it for a while. So we've gone through a few cycles like Kubernetes didn't even exist at the beginning of this in 2013. I mean, it, it existed probably internally somewhere, but it wasn't in the common discourse very much then, at least not in our working group. Uh, so it's been around, seen a few product cycles and that's been good. We also have seen the emergence of IoT during that time. That really wasn't part of the discourse so much then. Uh, that's a good thing for reasons I think I'll become clear later here. We tried to make it lightweight, I, lightweight, not too regimented. It doesn't say you have to go to cloud to do everything, even though there's um, a realistic uh, aspect of this that if you're a relatively small organization, you probably are gonna do all this in, in the cloud anyway. And uh, there is a uniform reference model, even though it's very lightweight, it deals with, um, I'll, I'll show you a picture of that later on. So that's a benefit maybe, mainly because some of the, uh, the draft writers don't use the same language across all the documents. So it gets hard to know in the security document what's being referred to in the architecture side. Well, interesting, the weaknesses of the document are kind of all the same things. <laughs> because it's mature, it doesn't have the latest stuff. Uh, the vendor neutrality often hides some of the use cases that are the really interesting ones. Kubernetes is sort of an example of that, but um, you know, Mesos and some of the other um, orchestration um, challenges that are product specific are really good ones to wrestle with. Um, being lightweight can be a problem. It's not because it's not a standard, it's not gonna change people's behavior and how they build, build things and a lot of the uh, the less technical people involved in this working group, because it wasn't just technology people. They were very concerned about the sort of thing that happened with Facebook this week, last week, and uh, the public disclosure, but of course, what happened in 2016 with that. And in fact, they talked about it so much, we got sick of hearing about it from them. We we thought we'd addressed it, but you know, I, I think we never fully satisfied the relatively lay public's concerns about protections put around public data in the, uh, for the folks whose, public, whose business models are built around uh, consent driven use of data. And the reference model is pretty simplistic. You know, I think this group will probably find it dismissive or, or dismissible, but that's okay. At least we know it is. So we, we think there's some things that are different about big data. Um, most, maybe the key thing is that multiple security schemes have to be addressed. You're looking at attack vectors that vary depending on whose organization it is. Countermeasures are not gonna be the same uh, for small companies compared to big companies. The, the people that originate the data or collate it may not be the same institution that is gonna deploy it. There's a sensibility about how to deal with sensors that uh, people who haven't worked in real-time systems are not aware of. Real-time stuff's not new in computing, but it's new for a whole generation or two of folks who um, who basically cut their teeth on transaction-driven kind of computing and uh, relatively static database work, you know, transaction-driven databases. And that's big data forces you to deal with Spark and that sort of thing. So that's important. Uh, the unintended uses and de-anonymization is a key thing that 
just because you don't have a social security number in a, in a row doesn't mean that people can't figure out who you're talking about in your data. Um, and so the architecture from a uh, privacy and security point of view need to deal with uh, de-anonymization de that occurs outside of your own organization downstream when the data is consumed. There are lots of problems with scale and complexity. Cloud magnifies this obviously. You get that with the traceability, the veracity, the kind of content that you're going to have to manage. Um, you know, uh, we used to call it bulk in the early days of databases. Now, bulk stuff is, you know, the main thing that's moving on our networks. I think somebody told me that uh, YouTube was, if not the most, one of the biggest uh, consumers on our uh, internal networks, which I find surprising because I don't, I'm not on it all the time, so I don't know who has time to look at it. Uh, Yes, there is training stuff on there that's worth having, of course. Um, and then there's jurisdiction issues that data is shared across uh, continents and that's common, not uncommon. And so you have, you, you have uh, multiple jurisdictions that are responsible for the data. So if you're gonna share both data and code in your networks across organizations and countries, big data presents you with problems you probably didn't anticipate in systems built earlier. Another thing that's kind of interesting that's is that big data power is now wielded by smaller organizations. Really, as small as one person can, um, you know, take that 50 million record data set that was floating around from Facebook and do a lot of things with it. Uh, that doesn't mean they have no governance, but they tend to be people with weak governance and weak training and tend to be de unregulated in unregulated settings anyway. So the fluffy part of talking about security for for big data is that it, it's affected by all these dimensions, volume, velocity, variety, veracity, and volatility, and of course, cloud. So I think people on this call, you know, based on my listening to this call, you don't need to be told why this matters, but it, it might be interesting to th if you think through each one of these and the frameworks that you're currently using uh, to manage them, you can see what the challenges are that you, that you face, and then just multiply that across organizations. What's left, less fluffy about what has emerged that we tried to worry about is the big data aspect of what is gonna to have to change in the software development life cycle. So Agile is part of this, the API first architecture is part of this, which you know, if you haven't heard that lingo, that's the you know, build to a specification first before you write any code because you know, if you need a geolocation service, you probably are gonna to need to understand how to get data from Google or Microsoft or some other, or from you know a government service that's uh, publishing that. Microservices and containers are going to be important. I sort of see these as uh, you know uh, children of the components and composable services movement. But um, this is still important. It, it it matters because that's this is going to be a new way that we need to manage security. Software-defined networks and 5G are going to be become important because. Now, mobile networks are providing this geolocation service that is one of the de the principal uh, drivers for de-anonymization of data sets. Left shift is important because this becomes part of uh, SecOps. So um, the orchestration of, if you want to call it that, of playbooks to run the tools that you have in the stack in, uh, in the security group becomes part of what needs to be coded. And we're gonna push that responsibility closer to the developers than it was before. So people have coined this as Sec DevOps or DevSecOps, but it's all kind of that, not the, the fluffy part of this uh, work to figure out how that needs to work and how, what kinds of frameworks need to be adopted to, to allow that. Uh, so Chris DM is kind of an interesting use case of a, a new model driven kind of thing in the health space that produced a lot of uh, unanticipated data sharing and analytical uh, challenges across multiple industries. And it, it probably is the, you know, it's one of those tip of the iceberg kind of things, but now Chris DM has been around for a while. It's a, a portable model building thing if you haven't run into that. So I think I already mentioned IOT, but you know, if you've been around a while, this is, you know, distrib distributed computing writ large with just more fatter pipes and, you know, more sensors and richer sensors. So the key trends we tried to worry about in the, in the draft were, were cloud, obviously, uh, IoT, especially as related to health and safety, uh, the mobility and pervasive computing. So that's, you know, metro 
metrics that are coming off individual people, including um, you know, the new voice driven kinds of things, but also the geolocation stuff that goes with most of these things. Uh, the data center automation that's happening, we're basically, uh, you know, as, as we're re rethinking how we uh, do our stack and rack kind of processes and the way that we build out uh, uh, protected um, sub networks inside the data center is now moving into software increasingly. So that's pushing the automation process further down onto the stack with routers and that kind of thing more than it used to be. Uh, trust and federation, we try to tackle that a little bit. And maybe one of the key things that, that I really pushed in this design was uh, more automation on domain specific processes, either through domain specific languages or explicit domain models. Um, and then the last trend is uh, moving more toward attribute based access models more than role based. And the reason for that is not that role based is gone, but um, that you really can't effectively instrument uh, access controls against. Uh, only a purely role-based thing if you have domain-based models that are using an attribute-based model. So um, this, this is a little, gets a little involved, but basically if you want to consume a, an ontology uh, and do that with an ABAC kind of system, you're, you're better off using attributes than roles. I mean, the roles can be derived from attributes. So it's a longer NIST pay, uh, paper on this that we, that we relied on for this. Hey, Mark. Um yeah. Can I ask one question regarding the ABAC uh, rather than the RBAC? Can I interpret that as uh, RBAC plus ABAC and uh, and moving to ABAC more and more? So we still need RBAC, right? Well, that's it's like saying, can you build something without admin? So I, I have a, a standard rant I get into on this, but um, you know, it seems like coders the first thing they want to do is 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 build an admin. It's like deciding to build a bridge with that has a guaranteed single point of failure in it. And it's uh, really one of the problems that we face with this, that um, that the architecture of the things we build have role-based things uh, built into them that don't need to be there. And so, yeah, they're, it's unavoidable. You can't, you can't have that if you've got an architecture with an admin role in it, you now have got to deal with it. Um, but I would argue you don't have to have that. Now, how you, how you do that, you know, depends on the, on the domain aspect of that, but, um, yeah, you, you can't do one without the other. We, we have a legacy of role-based uh, controls that are not just in our hardware systems and our operating systems, but in the security frameworks built around them. It's just unavoidable. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. So, and I have just a question. I'm not familiar with your um, vocabulary. Like, what does it mean to consume an ontology? Yeah, I, I knew I wouldn't get away with that. <laughs> so, uh, an ontology is a model um, and how you get from an ontology to a model, you know, varies a lot. So there's an OASIS group that's trying to develop a standard for doing that. So an example of that might be if you have an ontology that allows you to make an inference about logs coming out of Splunk that uh, represent a certain kind of attack. It could be that the log information uh, will tell you that, but the ontology tells you which logs to examine and which features you know, which of the fields in the logs are the ones that you need to look at. Because now what's happening with, with products like Splunk is you have not just uh, tons of logs by volume, but variety. So you have many different kinds of logs that need to be looked at in tandem in order to make inferences. So the ontology drives the inferences, but um, it needs to be ingested by tools like Splunk and, and other tools around that in order to know uh, what to look at. So that's one use case for that, but there, there are other ones. So I, I know I got away with saying that by, by talking fast here, but uh, that's of uh, course so not, not, not widely deployed, right? So I guess I, um, I'm trying to connect the dots between that use case, um, which it, it, it totally makes sense to me. Um, and I would have guessed that that's what you were talking about. How does that relate to ABAC? I can guess, but um, I'd be interested in your right. So Exactly. What, so most of the strategies for getting data out of, you know, RDF or one of the other ontology systems, you know, out of, out of OWL are to treat the nodes on these graph models as attributes. So that's how you get it into the attribute model. But for access control? Yep. Okay. So they, they're just storing 
Okay. I, I think this is a longer conversation. It, it I'll is. read your white paper. Yeah. Well, it is a longer conversation. So, yeah, maybe it's more important how we got here for this short conversation. And, you know, if there's interest, more interest, you know, you, this team might be able to drive some real solutions that are still floating around in the ether and you know, limited to academic spaces, you know, more than, than the practitioner space that we really would rather be in. Great. Let's keep going and then we'll circle back offline. Yeah. Good, good though. I, I mean, I'm, uh, that's an important topic. So if we have time down the road, that's really worthwhile. So influences that drove what we did here, the obviously the NIST 8053 because of its prevalence, not so much the content, but the prevalence of its adoption. The, the building automate, there's a smart building uh, ISO standard that uses ontologies as the base for it. So these are, and these are public because this particular ISO standard was designed to be public unlike a lot of the ISO work. So if you go to this uh, URL, you'll get a, a sort of background on that. What's interesting to me about this is how you take that obviously and try to do security with it. I mentioned these other, these other uh, ISO standards that are driving some of this work. Um, in 2675, this is an emerging standard. We're still, I think in 18 months into working on this standard, but it's, it's already got a lot of content uh, that's, that might be of interest to this group. Um, I see microsegmentation and NFV as one of the, you know, the main drivers for adding protections. Um, you know, we, we've all, we're all dealing with, uh, you know, the notion of zones that goes back pro probably 15 years, right? But the idea that, that, app, that application developers can uh, control the zones and the microsegmentations in which their, their, their containers are operate is, is a relatively new thing. It's probably being done in places that we just don't know about it yet. And the other influence, of course, is infrastructure as code. So I, I think I covered that already. So the use cases that are in the draft cover, so we're doing our time here. Oh, I'm over time, so I'm gonna go faster. So you'll find these use cases. One of the key use cases for big data is network protection. So if you're, if you're having to rent uh, disk space from Splunk, you already know about this. Let's see, so what we, one of the contributions I think of this report is we, we give them some, we give the users checklists. There's a pretty long bibliography that they can go to that is drawn from, you know, both academic sources and some industry sources. We did a deep dive on HL7, which is an, uh, uh, a healthcare standard about how they manage consent. Uh, I'll give you a, a, an idea about that consent problem. You know, the Facebook one is one that's being talked about today, but a bigger problem is, you know, how do you give consent for somebody to make decisions about when to pull the cord on you in, in a hospital setting? What do you do if your, your ex-wife, you know, still has, uh, has that consent because you never got around to repealing it? Um, what do you do about information about people that are handicapped in a building that's bringing down to you? Do you break the rules about sharing confidential information if it's gonna be needed to save their lives? So HL7 has kind of worked through a lot of those use cases and uh, we kind of took that into the big data space to, uh, to let's say to flesh out our detailed use cases. We came to the conclusion you can't do big data security without simulation that uh, if you wanna scale things up, you can't, you're not gonna be given big data spaces to operate. So if you're gonna do risk management and uh, the availability piece of CIA that you are gonna to have to do simulations. So that's another reason to have a model driven kind of approach to this. And what we did was, um, you know, try to go after the safety frameworks like um, uh, the material data, data safety standards, if anyone here has worked through that. Uh, we, we treat the data elements associated with PII and PCI on the way that people would with material data safety uh, records. Lastly, we have this notion of a system communicator, which is a, a sort of standard uh, software artifact that needs to be produced in a big data system to allow it to communicate to the uh, various consumers. So if you wanna know, well, when did you, you uh, provide consent for us to use your data for this, it remembers the whole session associated with you doing that. and it has a natural language sort of interface on a public website to do that. So I'm gonna skip these diagrams in the interest of time, we can come back to this. What I wanna show you is the, 
what we did with the uh, these safety conformance levels. So these conformance levels are people who choose to do so can look at this document and say, uh, we're attempting, you know, based on a self-assessment to follow a safety level of one, two, or three, uh, according to this NIST big data um, security standard. So at the highest level, which is what you know, I think this group might want to be interested in, is um, that it looks at automated use of these domain, domain models for security operations and for the SDLC. It pushes security and privacy risk to the, the uh, developer environment directly, uh, in likewise to configuration management. And there's a continuous test environment that moves to security, not just for code scans, but for things like whether firewall ports get open and closed and whether uh, containers are spun up and shut down when they're supposed to be and also pushes the test case authoring uh, more to the uh, the application side. So those are kind of principles from DevOps and left shift, but they are pushed into the, the safety standard. So now I want to show you a, a Word file, if I can get to it. So, yeah. So I'll just look for the, app, the appendix. Just thinking about it. Now it's not gonna let me jump to do it. Yeah, maybe we can do it with page numbers. I had this up earlier. Well, why don't we go to questions? Oh, here it is. All right. I was about to give up. The screen hasn't refreshed it. Okay. Us. Does this, uh, oh, I know why. Here it is. Now, can you see it? Oh, yep, yep. All right, great. Thanks. Right, so what we, this is basically the safety level. So this, this might be of interest. So we, you know, we try to identify, you know, what we think are the key points to improve safety. And, it, and believe me, this was a tough sell, even within our small group, because when we tried to analogize uh, the fact that the safety process in aviation is one that involves a lot of non-technical and trust-related work that's sort of non-computational. Um, that seemed un like unfamiliar territory, but um, that kind of is the gist of this, that while there are you know, computationally uh, perfectible solutions to certain parts of the problems, like you know, closing a firewall port or uh, patching, uh, say, a struts module, um, there are other parts of this that have to do with uh, less, uh, less easily protected elements. That is why aviation is safe because the whole supply chain is involved in the process of making it safety, it, making things safe. So, you know, the risk management and safety approach to this is, uh, is a bit novel in the security space, even though really it's kind of an obvious uh, thing. So the facets of this would be, you know, human touch points, uh, APIs, what the application models look like, authority to collect data, um, whether you've got a communicator for the fabric, whether you have uh, forensics playbooks, the business continuity, capacity management for security operations, um, how you manage consent and traceability for consent, continuous delivery for security and privacy components, uh, where you maintain and export your dependency and federation models, 
disaster planning and information sharing, uh, interoperability for the domain model. So I'm not just gonna read all these. So these are obviously not exclusive. They're, the attempt is just to pick some of the, of the key elements that we think will contribute to safety. So I'll stop here and take questions. This, I know we're covering a lot of ground here, but this document, you know, you can download it and we can talk about it in another meeting if it's of interest to this group. This is great. It would be great to add a link to the notes in this question I already got it. Sure, I'll do that too. Oh, here we go. No, I think Christian got it already. Sweet. Yeah, I, I may have found it. Yeah, echoing uh, you know uh, Sri's uh, comments in, in the chat here, um, it'd be fantastic to to make sure that we capture in uh, the minutes uh, a link to this presentation uh, and uh, the docs. Um, assuming they're somewhere uh, public on the internet or can be made so, if not, I can uh, you know find a, a place to to host it. Um, yeah, if, if it's not. I this was a make to order job, so I'll uh, I'll. I'll put a link to it in the in the Google Doc. Fantastic. We're at time, so I want to respect everyone's uh, um, time. Um, but uh, if anyone wants to stay, you know, a minute or so, over, uh, you know, can open up the the questions for for Mark. Anyone has to leave. Thank you for coming. Apologies for not using the time right. So my, my question, Mark, uh, you mentioned that uh, your uh, peer at uh, NIST uh, had additional context that uh, um, you know, was relevant to this group. Um, shall I uh, allocate time? Yeah, I would Please love to. I, he was a little fuzzy about what his commitment was in April. He was trying to uh, ask for time in April without naming the date. So I need to nail him down. But he's a... Uh, uh, he's a cryptology PhD at Fujitsu, and so he's uh, on top of the blockchain stuff and some other things that might be of interest. And, you know, the, the cryptology stuff enters into a lot of this federation and trust issues in kind of insidious ways, and uh, people have some unrealistic expectations about that. And mm -hmm. so there's that topic. And also the, uh, you know, the compute, the problem of computing on encrypted data is Mm -hmm. uh, worth uh, catching up with so that's that's still it's still a bit in the in the future planning but he's current on the work in that so i think yeah i think it would be great to have him here great well we we are um barreling towards a um presentation at the um uh cloud native computing foundation uh, toc um tech technical oversight committee sorry break down yeah. my uh, uh acronyms um uh, on the 17th of April. So I believe we'll probably need to, to focus in the um, coming weeks on preparation for that, right? Making sure that, it, that you know, everyone's aligned, all the ducks in a row, and uh, we're ready to uh, uh, you know, put our case in front of the uh, TOC and get approval uh, so we can begin, um, you know, operating officially as a uh, CNCF working group. So um, let's let's uh, you know set that aside for now and uh, come back uh, and you know, potentially have that as a discussion for some date later than the seventeenth of uh, April, which I believe is a Tuesday, um, and that probably means that the earliest date we could consider would be. Um, not that Friday because I'd like to sort of de debrief with everybody. Um, the 27th would be the earliest. Okay. Okay. Sure. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. And, uh, thank you, Ray, for, for sharing, uh, ex excited about the, um, the, uh, white paper document that's uh, getting rolling, um, you know, uh, over the, the, the course of this next week, if, uh, team members here can uh, you know have a look at that and um, I'd really love to get some of those um, footnotes put in uh, about uh, you know this being that you know called this and that in Kubernetes and whatnot uh, I, I think that'll go a long way to, to helping support that thanks everybody talk to you next week yeah. thanks everyone yeah